This audiobook The Art of War is brought to you by Explore. Traveler.com Transcribers Note This is a complete unabridged transcription of Lionel Yila's translation of The Art of War. See additional notes at the end of the book. Sun Tzu On the Art of War The oldest military treatise in the world. Translated from the Chinese with introduction and critical notes by Lionel Giles, M.A. Assistant in the Department of Oriental Printed Books and MSS. In the British Museum. London. Luzak and Company. 1910. Printed by E. J. Bill, Leiden, Holland. To my brother. Captain Valentine Giles, R.G. In the hope that. A work 2,400 years old. May yet contain lessons worth. Consideration. By the soldier of today. This translation is affectionately dedicated. Contents. Page. Preface 7 Introduction. Sun Wu and his book 11 The Text of Sun Tzu 30 The Commentators 34 Appreciations of Sun Tzu 42 Apologies for War 43 Bibliography L. Chap. I Laying Plans 1 2. Waging War 9 3. Attack by Stratagem 17 4. Tactical Dispositions 26 V Energy 33 Vi. Weak points and strong 42-7. Maneuvering 55-8. Variation of tactics 71-9. The army on the march 80x terrain 111. The nine situations 114-12. The attack by fire 150-13. The use of spies 160 Chinese concordance 176. Index 192. Preface. The seventh volume of memoir concerning l'histoire, lay sciences, lay arts, lay mer, Lay Usages, and C. De Chinois, 1, is devoted to the art of war, and contains, amongst other treatises, Lay Tres Articles de Sun Si, translated from the Chinese by a Jesuit father, Joseph Amiot. Per Amiot appears to have enjoyed no small reputation as a sinologue in his day, and the field of his labors was certainly extensive. But his so-called translation of Sun Tzu, if placed side by side with the original, is seen at once to be little better than an imposture. It contains a great deal that Sun Tzu did not write, and very little indeed of what he did. Here is a fair specimen, taken from the opening sentences of Chapter 5, De la Habili. Dons le gouvernement des troupes. Sun Tzu dit, A.A. les noms de tous les officiers tant généraux que subalterns, inscrives les dons un catalogue à part, avec la note des talents et de la capacité de chacun du, afin de pouvoir les employer avec avantage los l'occasion en sera venue. Fet en sorte que tu su que vous devez commander soit persuades que votre principal attention est de les preserver de tout dommage. Les troupes que vous faire as avancer contre l'ennemi duvin etre comme des pierres que vous lanceries contre des oeufs. De vous à l'ennemi il ne doit y avoir d'autre différence que celle du fort au foible, du vide au plan. Attaque as a découvert, mais soyez vencore en secret. Voilà en peu de mots en quoi consiste le habilite en toute la perfection même du gouvernement des troupes. Throughout the 19th century, which saw a wonderful development in the study of Chinese literature, no translator ventured to tackle Sun Tzu, although his work was known to be highly valued in China as by far the oldest and best compendium of military science. It was not until the year 1905 that the first English translation by Captain E. F. Caltrop, RFA, appeared at Tokyo under the title Sunshi, the Japanese form of Sun Tzu II. Unfortunately, it was evident that the translator's knowledge of Chinese was far too scanty to fit him to grapple with the manifold difficulties of Sun Tzu. He himself plainly acknowledges that without the aid of two Japanese gentlemen the accompanying translation would have been impossible. We can only wonder, then, that with their help it should have been so excessively bad. It is not merely a question of downright blunders, from which none can hope to be wholly exempt. Omissions were frequent, hard passages were willfully distorted or slurred over. Such offenses are less pardonable. They would not be tolerated in any edition of a Greek or Latin classic, and a similar standard of honesty ought to be insisted upon in translations from Chinese. From blemishes of this nature, at least, I believe that the present translation is free. It was not undertaken out of any inflated estimate of my own powers, but I could not help feeling that Sun Tzu deserved a better fate than had befallen him, and I knew that, at any rate, I could hardly fail to improve on the work of my predecessors. Towards the end of 1908, a new and revised edition of Captain Caltrop's translation was published in London, this time, however, without any allusion to his Japanese collaborators. 
my first three chapters were then already in the printer's hands, so that the criticisms of Captain Caltrop there and contained must be understood as referring to his earlier edition. In the subsequent chapters I have of course transferred my attention to the second edition. This is on the whole an improvement on the other, though there still remains much that cannot pass muster. Some of the grosser blunders have been rectified and lacunae filled up, but on the other hand a certain number of new mistakes appear. The very first sentence of the introduction is startlingly inaccurate, and later on, while mention is made of an army of Japanese commentators on Sun Tzu, who are these, by the way? Not a word is vouchsafed about the Chinese commentators, who nevertheless, I ventured to assert, form a much more numerous and infinitely more important army. A few special features of the present volume may now be noticed. In the first place, the text has been cut up into numbered paragraphs, both in order to facilitate cross-reference and for the convenience of students generally. The division follows broadly that of Sun Xing Yen's edition, but I have sometimes found it desirable to join two or more of his paragraphs into one. In quoting from other works, Chinese writers seldom give more than the bare title by way of reference, and the task of research is apt to be seriously hampered in consequence. With a view to obviating this difficulty so far as Sun Tzu is concerned, I have also appended a complete concordance of Chinese characters, following in this the admirable example of Leg, though an alphabetical arrangement has been preferred to the distribution under radicals which he adopted. Another feature barred from the Chinese classics is the printing of text, translation and notes on the same page. The notes, however, are inserted, according to the Chinese method, immediately after the passages to which they refer. From the mass of native commentary my aim has been to extract the cream only, adding the Chinese text here and there when it seemed to present points of literary interest. Though constituting in itself an important branch of Chinese literature, very little commentary of this kind has hitherto been made directly accessible by translation. 3. I may say in conclusion that, owing to the printing off of my sheets as they were completed, the work has not had the benefit of a final revision. On a review of the whole, without modifying the substance of my criticisms, I might have been inclined in a few instances to temper their asperity. Having chosen to wield a bludgeon, however, I shall not cry out if in return I am visited with more than a rap over the knuckles. Indeed, I have been at some pains to put a sword into the hands of future opponents by scrupulously giving either text or reference for every passage translated. A scathing review, even from the pen of the Shanghai critic who despises mere translations, would not, I must confess, be altogether unwelcome. For, after all, the worst fate I shall have to dread is that which befell the ingenious paradoxes of George and the Vicar of Wakefield. Introduction Sun Wu and his book SSU Ma Chen gives the following biography of Sun Tzu, 4. Sun Tzu Wu was a native of the Qi state. His art of war brought him to the notice of Ho Lu, 5, King of Wu. Ho Lu said to him, I have carefully perused your 13 chapters. May I submit your theory of managing soldiers to a slight test? Sun Tzu replied, You may. Ho Lu asked, May the test be applied to women? The answer was again in the affirmative, so arrangements were made to bring 180 ladies out of the palace. Sun Tzu divided them into two companies, and placed one of the king's favorite concubines at the head of each. He then bade them all take spears in their hands, and address them thus, I presume you know the difference between front and back, right hand and left hand? The girls replied, yes. Sun Tzu went on, when I say eyes front, you must look straight ahead. When I say left turn, you must face towards your left hand. When I say right turn, you must face towards your right hand. When I say about turn, you must face right round towards the back. Again the girls assented. The words of command having been thus explained, he set up the halberds and battle axes in order to begin the drill. Then, to the sound of drums, he gave the order right turn. But the girls only burst out laughing. Sun Tzu said, if words of command are not clear and distinct, if orders are not thoroughly understood, then the general is to blame. So he started drilling them again, and this time gave the order left turn, whereupon the girls once more burst into fits of laughter. Sun Tzu said, if words of command are not clear and distinct, if orders are not thoroughly understood, the general is to blame. But if his orders are clear, and the soldiers nevertheless disobey, then it is the fault of their officers. So saying, he ordered the leaders of the two companies to be beheaded. Now the king of Wu was watching the scene from the top of a raised pavilion, and when he saw that his favorite concubines were about to be executed, he was greatly alarmed and hurriedly sent down the following message, we are now quite satisfied as to our general's ability to handle troops. If we are bereft of these two concubines, our meat and drink will lose their savor. It is our wish that they shall not be beheaded. Sun Tzu replied, 
Having once received His Majesty's commission to be general of His forces, there are certain commands of His Majesty which, acting in that capacity, I am unable to accept. Accordingly, he had the two leaders beheaded, and straightway installed the pair next in order as leaders in their place. When this had been done, the drum was sounded for the drill once more, and the girls went through all the evolutions, turning to the right or to the left, marching ahead or wheeling back, kneeling or standing, with perfect accuracy and precision, not venturing to utter a sound. Then Sun Tzu sent a messenger to the king saying, Your soldiers, sire, are now properly drilled and disciplined, and ready for your majesty's inspection. They can be put to any use that their sovereign may desire, bid them go through fire and water, and they will not disobey. But the king replied, Let our general cease drilling and return to camp. As for us, we have no wish to come down and inspect the troops. Thereupon Sun Tzu said, The king is only fond of words, and cannot translate them into deeds. After that, Holu saw that Sun Tzu was one who knew how to handle an army, and finally appointed him general. In the west, he defeated the Chu state and forced his way into Ying, the capital, to the north, he put fear into the states of Qi and Qin, and spread his fame abroad amongst the feudal princes. And Sun Tzu shared in the might of the king. About Sun Tzu himself this is all that SSU Ma Chen has to tell us in this chapter. But he proceeds to give a biography of his descendant, Sun Pin, born about a hundred years after his famous ancestor's death, and also the outstanding military genius of his time. The historian speaks of him too as Sun Tzu, and in his preface we read, Sun Tzu had his feet cut off and yet continued to discuss the art of war. 6. It seems likely, then, that Pin was a nickname bestowed on him after his mutilation, unless indeed the story was invented in order to account for the name. The crowning incident of his career, the crushing defeat of his treacherous rival Pang Chuan, will be found briefly related on p. 40. To return to the elder Sun Tzu. He is mentioned in two other passages of the Shi Qi. In the third year of his reign, 512 BC, Ho Lu, king of Wu, took the field with Zhu Shu, i.e. Wu Yuan, and Po Pei, and attacked Chu. He captured the town of Shu and slew the two princes' sons who had formerly been generals of Wu. He was then meditating a descent on Ying, the capital, but the general Sun Wu said, the army is exhausted. 7. It is not yet possible. We must wait. 8. After further successful fighting, in the ninth year, 506 BC, King Ho Lu of Wu addressed Wu Zhu Shu and Sun Wu, saying, formerly, you declared that it was not yet possible for us to enter Ying. Is the time ripe now? The two men replied, choose general, Zhu Chang, nine is grasping and covetous, and the princes of Tang and Sai both have a grudge against him. If your majesty has resolved to make a grand attack, you must win over Tang and Sai, and then you may succeed. Ho Lu followed this advice, beat Chu in five pitched battles and marched into Ying. 10. This is the latest date at which anything is recorded of Sun Wu. He does not appear to have survived his patron, who died from the effects of a wound in 496. In the chapter entitled, the earlier portion of which M. Chavon believes to be a fragment of a treatise on military weapons, there occurs this passage, 11. From this time onward, a number of famous soldiers arose, one after the other, Cao Fan, 12, who was employed by the Qin state, Wang Zhu, 13 in the service of Qi, and Sun Wu in the service of Wu. These men developed and threw light upon the principles of war. It is obvious that SSU Ma Chen at least had no doubt about the reality of Sun Wu as an historical personage, and with one exception, to be noticed presently, he is by far the most important authority on the period in question. It will not be necessary, therefore, to say much of such a work as the Wu Yue Chun Chu, which is supposed to have been written by Zhao Ye of the 1st century AD. The attribution is somewhat doubtful, but even if it were otherwise, his account would be of little value, based as it is on the Shi Qi and expanded with romantic details. The story of Sun Tzu will be found, for what it is worth, in Chapter 2. The only new points in it worth noting are. 1. Sun Tzu was first recommended to Ho Lu by Wu Zhu Shu. 2. He is called a native of Wu. 14. 3. He had previously lived a retired life, and his contemporaries were unaware of his ability. 15. The following passage occurs in Huainan Tzu, when sovereign and ministers show perversity of mind, it is impossible even for a Sun Tzu to encounter the foe. 16. Assuming that this work is genuine, and hitherto no doubt has been cast upon it, we have here the earliest direct reference to Sun Tzu, for Huainan Tzu died in 122 BC, many years before the Shi Qi was given to the world. Lu Shang, BC 89, in his says, The reason why Sun Wu at the head of 30,000 men beat Chu with 200,000 is that the latter were undisciplined. 17. 
Tang Mingxi in his, completed in 1134, informs us that the surname was bestowed on Sun Wu's grandfather by Duke Qing of Qi, 547-490 BC. Sun Wu's father Sun Ping, rose to be a minister of state in Qi and Sun Wu himself, whose style was Chang Qing, fled to Wu on account of the rebellion which was being fomented by the kindred of Tian Pao. He had three sons, of whom the second, named Ming, was the father of Sun Pen. According to this account, then, Pin was the grandson of Wu, 18, which, considering that Sun Pin's victory over Wei was gained in 341 BC, may be dismissed as chronologically impossible. Whence these data were obtained by Tang Mingxi I do not know, but of course no reliance whatever can be placed in them. An interesting document which has survived from the close of the Han period is the short preface written by the great Cao Cao, or Wei Wu Ti, for his edition of Sun Tzu. I shall give it in full. I have heard that the ancients used bows and arrows to their advantage. 19. The Lunyi says, there must be a sufficiency of military strength. 20. The Xu Qing mentions the army among the eight objects of government. 21. The I Qing says, army indicates firmness and justice, the experienced leader will have good fortune. 22. The Xi Qing says, the king rose majestic in his wrath, and he marshaled his troops. 23. The Yellow Emperor, Tang the Completer and Wu Wang all used spears and battle axes in order to succor their generation. The SSU Ma Fa says, if one man slay another of set purpose, he himself may rightfully be slain. 24. He who relies solely on warlike measures shall be exterminated, he who relies solely on peaceful measures shall perish. Instances of this are Fu Chai 25, on the one hand and Yen Wang on the other. 26. In military matters, the sage's rule is normally to keep the peace, and to move his forces only when occasion requires. He will not use armed force unless driven to it by necessity. 27. Many books have I read on the subject of war and fighting, but the work composed by Sun Wu is the profoundest of them all. Sun Tzu was a native of the Qi state, his personal name was Wu. He wrote The Art of War in 13 chapters for Ho Lu, King of Wu. Its principles were tested on women, and he was subsequently made a general. He led an army westwards, crushed the Chu state and entered Ying the capital. In the north, he kept Qi and Qin in awe. A hundred years and more after his time, Sun Pin lived. He was a descendant of Wu. 28. In his treatment of deliberation and planning, the importance of rapidity in taking the field, 29. Clearness of conception, and depth of design, Sun Tzu stands beyond the reach of carping criticism. My contemporaries, however, have failed to grasp the full meaning of his instructions, and while putting into practice the smaller details in which his work abounds, they have overlooked its essential purport. That is the motive which has led me to outline a rough explanation of the whole. 30. One thing to be noticed in the above is the explicit statement that the 13. Chapters were specially composed for King Ho Lu. This is supported by the internal evidence of I. Section 15, in which it seems clear that some ruler is addressed. In the bibliographical section of the Han Shu, 31, there is an entry which has given rise to much discussion, the works of Sun Tzu of Wu in 82 pn, or chapters, with diagrams in 9 Chuan. It is evident that this cannot be merely the 13 chapters known to SSU Ma Chen, or those we possess today. Chang Shu. Chi in his refers to an edition of Sun Tzu's of which the 13 chapters form the first Chuan, adding that there were two other Chuan besides. 32. This has brought forth a theory, that the bulk of these 82 chapters consisted of other writings of Sun Tzu, we should call them apocryphal, similar to the Wen Ta, of which a specimen dealing with the nine situations 33 is preserved in the Tong Tian, and another in Ho Shi's commentary. It is suggested that before his interview with Ho Lu, Sun Tzu had only written the 13 chapters, but afterwards composed a sort of exegesis in the form of question and answer between himself and the king. Pai Hasun, author of the Sun Tzu Shulu, backs this up with a quotation from the Wu Yue Chun Chu, the king of Wu summoned Sun Tzu, and asked him questions about the art of war. Each time he set forth a chapter of his work, the king could not find words enough to praise him. 34. As he points out, if the whole work was expounded on the same scale as in the above-mentioned fragments, the total number of chapters could not fail to be considerable. 35. Then the numerous other treatises attributed to Sun Tzu 36, might also be included. The fact that the Han Chi mentions no work of Sun Tzu except the 82 pn, whereas the Suai and Tang bibliographies give the titles of others in addition to the 13 chapters, is good proof, Pai I Hasun thinks, that all of these were contained in the 82 pn. Without pinning our faith to the accuracy of details supplied by the Wu Yue Chun Chu, or admitting the genuineness of any of the treatises cited by Pai I Hasun, 
we may see in this theory a probable solution of the mystery. Between SSU Ma Chen and Pan Ku there was plenty of time for a luxuriant crop of forgeries to have grown up under the magic name of Sun Tzu, and the 82 PN may very well represent a collected edition of these lumped together with the original work. It is also possible, though less likely, that some of them existed in the time of the earlier historian and were purposely ignored by him. 37. Tu Mu, after Cao Kung the most important commentator on Sun Tzu, composed the preface to his edition 38, about the middle of the 9th century. After a somewhat lengthy defense of the military art, 39, he comes at last to Sun Tzu himself, and makes one or two very startling assertions, the writings of Sun Wu, he says, originally comprised several hundred thousand words, but Cao Cao, the emperor Wu Wei, pruned away all redundancies and wrote out the essence of the whole, so as to form a single book in thirteen chapters. 40, he goes on to remark that Cao Cao's commentary on Sun Tzu leaves a certain proportion of difficulties unexplained. This, in Tu Mu's opinion, does not necessarily imply that he was unable to furnish a complete commentary. 41. According to the Wei Qi, Cao himself wrote a book on war in something over 100,000 words, known as the It appears to have been of such exceptional merit that he suspects Cao to have used for it the surplus material which he had found in Sun Tzu. He concludes, however, by saying, The Xin Shu is now lost, so that the truth cannot be known for certain. 42. Tu Mu's conjecture seems to be based on a passage in the way Wu Ti strung together Sun Wu's Art of War, 43, which in turn may have resulted from a misunderstanding of the final words of Cao Kung's preface. This, as Sun Xing Yen points out, 44 is only a modest way of saying that he made an explanatory paraphrase, 45, or in other words, wrote a commentary on it. On the whole, the theory has met with very little acceptance. Thus, the says, 46, the mention of the 13 chapters in the Shi Qi shows that they were in existence before the Han Qi, and that later accretions are not to be considered part of the original work. Tu Mu's assertion can certainly not be taken as proof. 47. There is every reason to suppose, then, that the 13 chapters existed in the time of SSU Ma Chen practically as we have them now. That the work was then well known he tells us in so many words, Sun Tzu's 13 chapters and Wu Qi's Art of War are the two books that people commonly refer to on the subject of military matters. Both of them are widely distributed, so I will not discuss them here. 48. But as we go further back, serious difficulties begin to arise. The salient fact which has to be faced is that the So Chuan, the great contemporary record, makes no mention whatever of Sun Wu, either as a general or as a writer. It is natural, in view of this awkward circumstance, that many scholars should not only cast doubt on the story of Sun Wu as given in the Shi Qi, but even show themselves frankly skeptical as to the existence of the man at all. The most powerful presentment of this side of the case is to be found in the following disquisition by Ye Shui Xin, 49. It is stated in SSU Ma Chen's history that Sun Wu was a native of the Qi state, and employed by Wu, and that in the reign of Holu he crushed Chu, entered Ying, and was a great general. But in So's commentary no Sun Wu appears at all. It is true that So's commentary need not contain absolutely everything that other histories contain. But So has not omitted to mention vulgar plebeians and hireling ruffians such as Ying Kao Shu, 50, Cao Kui, 51, Chu Qi Wu 52, and Chuan Shi Chu. 53, in the case of Sun Wu, whose fame and achievements were so brilliant, the omission is much more glaring. Again, details are given, in their due order about his contemporaries Wu Yuan and the minister Pei. 54. Is it credible that Sun Wu alone should have been passed over? 55. In point of literary style, Sun Tzu's work belongs to the same school as Quan Zhu, 56, the Lu Tao, 57, and the Yu 58, and may have been the production of some private scholar living towards the end of the spring and autumn or the beginning of the Warring States period. 59. The story that his precepts were actually applied by the Wu state, is merely the outcome of big talk on the part of his followers. 60 From the flourishing period of the Chou dynasty 61, down to the time of the spring and autumn, all military commanders were statesmen as well, and the class of professional generals, for conducting external campaigns, did not then exist. It was not until the period of the six states, 62, that this custom changed. Now although Wu was an uncivilized state, is it conceivable that So should have left unrecorded the fact that Sun Wu was a great general and yet held no civil office? What we are told, therefore, about Jiang Chu 63, and Sun Wu, is not authentic matter, but the reckless fabrication of theorizing pundits. The story of Ho Lu's experiment on the women, in particular, is utterly preposterous and incredible. 64. 
Ye Shui Shen represents SSU Ma Chen as having said that Sun Wu crushed Chu and entered Ying. This is not quite correct. No doubt the impression left on the reader's mind is that he at least shared in these exploits, but the actual subject of the verbs, and is certainly, as is shown by the next words. 65. The fact may or may not be significant, but it is nowhere explicitly stated in the Shi Chi either that Sun Tzu was general on the occasion of the taking of Ying, or that he even went there at all. Moreover, as we know that Wu Yuan and Po Pei both took part in the expedition, and also that its success was largely due to the dash and enterprise of Fukai, Po Lu's younger brother, it is not easy to see how yet another general could have played a very prominent part in the same campaign. Chen Chen son of the Song dynasty has the note, 66. Military writers look upon Sun Wu as the father of their art. But the fact that he does not appear in the Tso Chuan, although he is said to have served under Ho Lu king of Wu, makes it uncertain what period he really belonged to. 67. He also says. The works of Sun Wu and Wu Qi may be of genuine antiquity. 68. It is noticeable that both Ye Shui Shen and Chen Chen Sun, while rejecting the personality of Sun Wu as he figures in SSU Ma Chen's history, are inclined to accept the date traditionally assigned to the work which passes under his name. The author of the Shu Lu fails to appreciate this distinction, and consequently his bitter attack on Chen Chen Sun really misses its mark. He makes one or two points, however, which certainly tell in favor of the high antiquity of our thirteen chapters. Sun Tzu, he says, must have lived in the age of Qing Wang, 519-476, because he is frequently plagiarized in subsequent works of the Chou, Qin and Han dynasties. 69. The two most shameless offenders in this respect are Wu Qi and Huainan Zhu, both of them important historical personages in their day. The former lived only a century after the alleged date of Sun Tzu, and his death is known to have taken place in 381 BC it was to him, according to Lu Shang, that Seng Shen delivered the Tso Chuan, which had been entrusted to him by its author. 70. Now the fact that quotations from the art of war, acknowledged or otherwise, are to be found in so many authors of different epics, establishes a very strong probability that there was some common source anterior to them all, in other words, that Sun Tzu's treatise was already in existence towards the end of the 5th century BC further proof of Sun Tzu's antiquity is furnished by the archaic or wholly obsolete meanings attaching to a number of the words he uses. A list of these, which might perhaps be extended, is given in the Shulu, and though some of the interpretations are doubtful, the main argument is hardly affected thereby. 71. Again, it must not be forgotten that Ye Shui Shin, a scholar and critic of the first rank, deliberately pronounces the style of the thirteen chapters to belong to the early part of the fifth century. Seeing that he is actually engaged in an attempt to disprove the existence of Sun Wu himself, we may be sure that he would not have hesitated to assign the work to a later date had he not honestly believed the contrary. And it is precisely on such a point that the judgment of an educated Chinaman will carry most weight. Other internal evidence is not far to seek. Thus, in 13. Section 1, there is an unmistakable allusion to the ancient system of land tenure which had already passed away by the time of Mencius, who was anxious to see it revived in a modified form. 72. The only warfare Sun Tzu knows is that carried on between the various feudal princes, in which armored chariots play a large part. Their use seems to have entirely died out before the end of the Chou dynasty. He speaks as a man of Wu, a state which ceased to exist as early as 473 BC on this I shall touch presently. But once refer the work to the 5th century or earlier, and the chances of its being other than a bona fide production are sensibly diminished. The great age of forgeries did not come until long after. That it should have been forged in the period immediately following 473 is particularly unlikely, for no one, as a rule, hastens to identify himself with a lost cause. As for Ye Shui Shin's theory, that the author was a literary recluse, 73, that seems to me quite untenable. If one thing is more apparent than another after reading the maxims of Sun Tzu, it is that their essence has been distilled from a large store of personal observation and experience. They reflect the mind not only of a born strategist, gifted with a rare faculty of generalization, but also of a practical soldier closely acquainted with the military conditions of his time. To say nothing of the fact that these sayings have been accepted and endorsed by all the greatest captains of Chinese history, they offer a combination of freshness and sincerity, acuteness and common sense, which quite excludes the idea that they were artificially concocted in the study. If we admit, then, that the thirteen chapters were the genuine production of a military man living towards the end of the Chun Chu period, are we not bound, in spite of the silence of the Tso Chuan, to accept SSU Ma Chen's account in its entirety? In view of his high repute as a sober historian, 
must we not hesitate to assume that the records he drew upon for Sun Wu's biography were false and untrustworthy? The answer, I fear, must be in the negative. There is still one grave, if not fatal, objection to the chronology involved in the story as told in the Shi Qi, which, so far as I am aware, nobody has yet pointed out. There are two passages in Sun Tzu in which he alludes to. Contemporary Affairs. The first is in Vi. Section 21. Though according to my estimate the soldiers of Yue exceed our own in number, that shall advantage them nothing in the matter of victory. I say then that victory can be achieved. The other is in 11. Section 30. Asked if an army can be made to imitate the Shuai Jan, I should answer, yes. For the men of Wu and the men of Yue are enemies, yet if they are crossing a river in the same boat and are caught by a storm, they will come to each other's assistance just as the left hand helps the right. These two paragraphs are extremely valuable as evidence of the date of composition. They assign the work to the period of the struggle between Wu and Yue. So much has been observed by Pai I Hasun. But what has hitherto escaped notice is that they also seriously impair the credibility of SSU Ma Chen's narrative. As we have seen above, the first positive date given in connection with Sun Wu is 512 BC he is then spoken of as a general, acting as confidential advisor to Ho Lu, so that his alleged introduction to that monarch had already taken place, and of course the 13 chapters must have been written earlier still. But at that time, and for several years after, down to the capture of Ying in 506, Chu and not Yue, was the great hereditary enemy of Wu. The two states, Chu and Wu, had been constantly at war for over half a century, 74, whereas the first war between Wu and Yue was waged only in 510, 75, and even then was no more than a short interlude sandwiched in the midst of the fierce struggle with Chu. Now Chu is not mentioned in the 13 chapters at all. The natural inference is that they were written at a time when Yue had become the prime antagonist of Wu, that is, after Chu had suffered the great humiliation of 506. At this point, a table of dates may be found useful. BC. 514 Accession of Holu. 512 Holu attacks Chu, but is dissuaded from entering Ying, the capital. Shi Qi mentions Sun Wu as general. 511 Another attack on Chu. 510 Wu makes a successful attack on Yue. This is the first war between the two states. 509 Or. Chu invades Wu, but is signally defeated at Yu Chang. 508 506. Holu attacks Chu with the aid of Tang and Sai. Decisive battle of Po Chu, and capture of Ying. Last mention of Sun Wu and Shi Qi. 505 Yue makes a raid on Wu in the absence of its army. Wu is beaten by Qin and evacuates Ying. 504 Ho Lu sends Fu Chai to attack Chu. 497 Ko Chen becomes king of Yue. 496 Wu attacks Yue, but is defeated by Ko Chen at Chui Li. Ho Lu is killed. 494 Fu Chai defeats Ko Chen in the Great Battle of Fu Chiyo, and enters the capital of Yue. 485 Or. 484. Ko Chen renders homage to Wu. Death of Wu Zushu. 482 Ko Chen invades Wu in the absence of Fu Chai. 478. 2. 476. Further attacks by Yue on Wu. 475 Ko Chen lays siege to the capital of Wu. 473 Final defeat and extinction of Wu. The sentence quoted above from Vi. Section 21 hardly strikes me as one that could have been written in the full flush of victory. It seems rather to imply that, for the moment at least, the tide had turned against Wu, and that she was getting the worst of the struggle. Hence we may conclude that our treatise was not in existence in 505, before which date Yue does not appear to have scored any notable success against Wu. Holu died in 496, so that if the book was written for him, it must have been during the period 505 to 496, when there was a lull in the hostilities, Wu having presumably been exhausted by its supreme effort against Chu. On the other hand, if we choose to disregard the tradition connecting Sun Wu's name with Ho Lu, it might equally well have seen the light between 496 and 494, or possibly in the period 482 to 473, when Yue was once again becoming a very serious menace. 76, we may feel fairly certain that the author, whoever he may have been, was not a man of any great eminence in his own day. On this point the negative testimony of the Tso Chuan far outweighs any shred of authority still attaching to the Shi Qi, if once its other facts are discredited. Sun Xing Yan, however, makes a feeble attempt to explain the omission of his name from the Great Commentary. It was Wu Zushu, he says, who got all the credit of Sun Wu's exploits, 
because the latter, being an alien, was not rewarded with an office in the state. 77. How then did the Sun Tzu legend originate? It may be that the growing celebrity of the book imparted by degrees a kind of factitious renown to its author. It was felt to be only right and proper that one so well versed in the science of war should have solid achievements to his credit as well. Now the capture of Ying was undoubtedly the greatest feat of arms in Ho Lu's reign, it made a deep and lasting impression on all the surrounding states, and raised Wu to the short-lived zenith of her power. Hence, what more natural, as time went on, than that the acknowledged master of strategy, Sun Wu should be popularly identified with that campaign, at first perhaps only in the sense that his brain conceived and planned it, afterwards, that it was actually carried out by him in conjunction with Wu Yuan, 78, Po Pei and Fu Kai. It is obvious that any attempt to reconstruct even the outline of Sun Tzu's life must be based almost wholly on conjecture. With this necessary proviso, I should say that he probably entered the service of Wu about the time of Ho Lu's accession, and gathered experience, though only in the capacity of a subordinate officer during the intense military activity which marked the first half of that prince's reign. 79. If he rose to be a general at all, he certainly was never on an equal footing with the three above mentioned. He was doubtless present at the investment and occupation of Ying, and witnessed Wu's sudden collapse in the following year. Yue's attack at this critical juncture, when her rival was embarrassed on every side, seems to have convinced him that this upstart kingdom was the great enemy against whom every effort would henceforth have to be directed. Sun Wu was thus a well-seasoned warrior when he sat down to write his famous book, which according to my reckoning must have appeared. Towards the end, rather than the beginning, of Ho Lu's reign. The story of the women may possibly have grown out of some real incident occurring about the same time. As we hear no more of Sun Wu after this from any source, he is hardly likely to have survived his patron or to have taken part in the death struggle with Yue, which began with the disaster at Chuili. If these inferences are approximately correct, there is a certain irony in the fate which decreed that China's most illustrious man of peace should be contemporary with her greatest writer on war. The Text of Sun Tzu I have found it difficult to glean much about the history of Sun Tzu's text. The quotations that occur in early authors go to show that the 13 chapters of which SSU Ma Chen speaks were essentially the same as those now extant. We have his word for it that they were widely circulated in his day, and can only regret that he refrained from discussing them on that account. 80, Sun Xing Yan says in his preface. During the Qin and Han dynasty Sun Tzu's art of war was in general use amongst military commanders, but they seemed to have treated it as a work of mysterious import, and were unwilling to expound it for the benefit of posterity. Thus it came about that Wei Wu was the first to write a commentary on it. 81. As we have already seen, there is no reasonable ground to suppose that Cao Kung tampered with the text. But the text itself is often so obscure, and the number of editions which appeared from that time onward so great, especially during the Tang and Sung dynasties, that it would be surprising if numerous corruptions had not managed to creep in. Towards the middle of the Sung period, by which time all the chief commentaries on Sun Tzu were in existence, a certain Qi Tianpao published a work in 15 Chuan entitled Sun Tzu with the collected commentaries of ten writers. 82. There was another text, with variant readings. Put forward by Chu Fu of Ta Xing, 83, which also had supporters among the scholars of that period, but in the Ming editions, Sun Xing Yan tells us, these readings were for some reason or other no longer put into circulation. 84. Thus, until the end of the 18th century, the text in sole possession of the field was one derived from Qi Tianpao's edition, although no actual copy of that important work was known to have survived. That, therefore, is the text of Sun Tzu which appears in the war section of the Great Imperial Encyclopedia printed in 1726, the Kuchin Tu Shu Qi Cheng. Another copy at my disposal of what is practically the same text, with slight variations, is that contained in the Eleven Philosophers of the Chou and Qin Dynasties, 1758. And the Chinese printed in Captain Caltrop's first edition is evidently a similar version which has filtered through Japanese channels. So things remained until Sun Xing Yan, 1752-1818, a distinguished antiquarian and classical scholar, 85, who claimed to be an actual descendant of Sun Wu, 86, accidentally discovered a copy of Qi Tian Pao's long-lost work, went on a visit to the library of the Hua Yin Temple. 87, appended to it was the Aishuo of Cheng Yusheng, mentioned in the Tung Chi, and also believed to have perished. 88, this is what Sun Xing Yan designates as the or original edition, or text, a rather misleading name, for it cannot by any means claim to set before us the text of Sun Tzu in its pristine purity. Qi Tianpao was a careless compiler, 89, and appears to have been content to reproduce the somewhat debased version current in his day, 
without troubling to collate it with the earliest editions then available. Fortunately, two versions of Sun Tzu, even older than the newly discovered work, were still extant, one buried in the Tung Tian, two used great treatise on the Constitution, the other similarly enshrined in the Tai Ping Yulan Encyclopedia. In both the complete text is to be found, though split up into fragments, intermixed with other matter, and scattered piecemeal over a number of different sections. Considering that the Yulan takes us back to the year 983, and the Tung Tian about 200 years further still, to the middle of the Tang Dynasty, the value of these early transcripts of Sun Tzu can hardly be overestimated. Yet the idea of utilizing them does not seem to have occurred to anyone until Sun Xing Yen, acting under government instructions, undertook a thorough recension of the text. This is his own account. Because of the numerous mistakes in the text of Sun Tzu which his editors had handed down, the government ordered that the ancient edition, of Qi Tian Pao, should be used, and that the text should be revised and corrected throughout. It happened that Wu Ninhu, the governor Pai Kua, and Xi, a graduate of the second degree, had all devoted themselves to this study, probably surpassing me therein. Accordingly, I have had the whole work cut on blocks as a textbook for military men. 90. The three individuals here referred to had evidently been occupied on the text of Sun Tzu prior to Sun Xing Yen's commission, but we are left in doubt as to the work they really accomplished. At any rate, the new edition, when ultimately produced, appeared in the names of Sun Xing Yan and only one co editor, Wu Jenqi. They took the original text as their basis, and by careful comparison with the older versions, as well as the extant commentaries and other sources of information such as the Aishuo, succeeded in restoring a very large number of doubtful passages, and turned out, on the whole, what must be accepted as the closest approximation we are ever likely to get to Sun Tzu's original work. This is what will hereafter be denominated the standard text. The copy which I have used belongs to a reissue dated 1877. It is in six pen, forming part of a well-printed set of 23 early philosophical works in 83 pen. 91. It opens with a preface by Sun Xing Yan, largely quoted in this introduction, vindicating the traditional view of Sun Tzu's life and performances, and summing up in remarkably concise fashion the evidence in its favor. This is followed by Cao Kung's preface to his edition, and the biography of Sun Tzu from the Shi Qi, both translated above. Then come, firstly, Cheng Yusheng's Aishuo, 92, with author's preface, and next, a short miscellany of historical and bibliographical information entitled Sun Tzu Shu Lu, compiled by Pai Aisun. As regards the body of the work, each separate sentence is followed by a note on the text, if required, and then by the various commentaries appertaining to it, arranged in chronological order. These we shall now proceed to discuss briefly, one by one. The Commentators Sun Tzu can boast an exceptionally long and distinguished role of commentators, which would do honor to any classic. Aung Su remarks on this fact. Though he wrote before the tale was complete, and rather ingeniously explains it by saying that the artifices of war, being inexhaustible, must therefore be susceptible of treatment in a great variety of ways. 93-1. Cao Cao or Cao Kung, afterwards known as Wei Wu Ti, AD 155-220. There is hardly any room for doubt that the earliest commentary on Sun Tzu actually came from the pen of this extraordinary man, whose biography in the San Quo Chi 94, reads like a romance. One of the greatest military geniuses that the world has seen, and Napoleonic in the scale of his operations, he was especially famed for the marvelous rapidity of his marches, which has found expression in the line talk of Cao Cao, and Cao Cao will appear. Aung Su says of him that he was a great captain who measured his strength against Tung Cho, Lu Pu and the two Yuan, father and son, and vanquished them all, whereupon he divided the empire of Han with Wu and Shu, and made himself king. It is recorded that whenever a council of war was held by Wei on the eve of a far-reaching campaign, he had all his calculations ready, those generals who made use of them did not lose one battle in ten, those who ran counter to them in any particular. Saw their armies incontinently beaten and put to flight. 95. Cao Kung's notes on Sun Tzu, models of austere brevity, are so thoroughly characteristic of the stern commander known to history, that it is hard indeed to conceive of them as the work of a mere literator. Sometimes, indeed, owing to extreme compression, they are scarcely intelligible and stand no less in need of a commentary than the text itself. 96. As we have seen, Cao Kung is the reputed author of the, A Book on War in 100,000 Odd Words, now lost, but mentioned in the. 97. 2. Mengxi. The commentary which has come down to us under this name is comparatively meager, and nothing about the author is known. Even his personal name has not been recorded. Qi Tian Pao's edition places him after Chia Lin, 
and Zhao Kungwu also assigns him to the Tang Dynasty, 98, but this is obviously a mistake, as his work is mentioned in the. In Sun Xing Yen's preface, he appears as Meng Shi of. The Liang Dynasty, 502 to 557. Others would identify him with Meng Kang of the 3rd century. In the 99, he is named last of the five commentators, the others being Wei Wu Ti, Tu Mu, Chen Hao, and Chia Lin. 3. Li Chuan of the 8th century was a well known writer on military tactics. His has been in constant use down to the present day. The mentions, Lives of Famous Generals from the Chou to the Tang Dynasty, as written by him. 100. He is also generally supposed to be the real author of the popular Taoist tract, the According to Zhao Kang. Wu in the Tianai Ko Catalog, 101, he followed the text of Sun Tzu, which differs considerably from those now extant. His notes are mostly short and to the point, and he frequently illustrates his remarks by anecdotes from Chinese history. 4. Tu Yu, Guide 812, did not publish a separate commentary on Sun Tzu, his notes being taken from the Tung Tian, the encyclopedic treatise on the constitution which was his life work. They are largely repetitions of Cao Kung and Mengxi, besides which it is believed that he drew on the ancient commentaries of Wang Ling and others. Owing to the peculiar arrangement of the Tung Tian, he has to explain each passage on its merits, apart from the context, and sometimes his own explanation does not agree with that of Cao Kung, whom he always quotes first. Though not strictly to be reckoned as one of the ten commentators, he was added to their number by Qi Tian Pao, being wrongly placed after his grandson Tu Mu. 5. Tu Mu, 803-852, is perhaps best known as a poet, a bright star even in the glorious galaxy of the Tang period. We learn from Zhao Kung Wu that although he had no practical experience of war, he was extremely fond of discussing the subject, and was moreover well read in the military history of the Chun Chu and Chan Kuo eras. 102. His notes, therefore, are well worth attention. They are very copious, and replete with historical parallels. The gist of Sun Tzu's work is thus summarized by him, practice benevolence and justice, but on the other hand make full use of artifice and measures of expediency. 103. He further declared that all the military triumphs and disasters of the thousand years which had elapsed since Sun Wu's death would, upon examination, be found to uphold and corroborate, in every particular, the maxims contained in his book. 104. Tu Mu's somewhat spiteful charge against Cao Kung has already been considered elsewhere. 6. Chen Hao appears to have been a contemporary of Tu Mu. Zhao Kung Wu says that he was impelled to write a new commentary on Sun Tzu because Cao Kung's on the one hand was too obscure and subtle, and that of Tu Mu on the other too long-winded and diffuse. 105. Ouyang Su, writing in the middle of the 11th century, calls Cao Kung, Tu Mu and Chen Hao the three chief commentators on Sun Tzu, and observes that Chen Hao is continually attacking Tu Mu's shortcomings. His commentary, though not lacking in merit, must rank below those of his predecessors. 7. Chia Lin is known to have lived under the Tang Dynasty, for his commentary on Sun Tzu is mentioned in the and was afterwards republished by Qi She of the same dynasty together with those of Mengxi and Tu Yu. 106. It is of somewhat scanty texture, and in point of quality, too, perhaps the least valuable of the eleven. 8. Mei Yao Chen, 1002-1060, commonly known by his style as Mei Sheng Yu, was, like Tu Mu, a poet of distinction. His commentary was published with a laudatory preface by the great U. Yang Su, from which we may call the following. Later scholars have misread Sun Tzu, distorting his words and trying to make them square with their own one-sided views. Thus, though commentators have not been lacking, only a few have proved equal to the task. My friend Sheng. You has not fallen into this mistake. In attempting to provide a critical commentary for Sun Tzu's work, he does not lose sight of the fact that these sayings were intended for states engaged in internecine warfare, that the author is not concerned with the military conditions prevailing under the sovereigns of the three ancient dynasties, 107, nor with the nine punitive measures prescribed to the minister of war. 108. Again, Sun Wu loved brevity of diction, but his meaning is always deep. Whether the subject be marching an army, or handling soldiers, or estimating the enemy, or controlling the forces of victory, it is always systematically treated. The sayings are bound together in strict logical sequence, though this has been obscured by commentators who have probably failed to grasp their meaning. In his own commentary, Mei Sheng Yu has brushed aside all the obstinate prejudices of these critics, and has tried to bring out the true meaning of Sun Tzu himself. In this way, the clouds of confusion have been dispersed and the sayings made clear. 
I am convinced that the present work deserves to be handed down side by side with the three great commentaries, and for a great deal that they find in the sayings, coming generations will have constant reason to thank my friend Shunya. 109. Making some allowance for the exuberance of friendship, I am inclined to endorse this favorable judgment, and would certainly place him above Chen Hao in order of merit. 9. Wang Shi, also of the Sung dynasty, is decidedly original in some of his interpretations, but much less judicious than Mei Yao Chen, and on the whole not. A very trustworthy guide. He is fond of comparing his own commentary with that of Cao Kung, but the comparison is not often flattering to him. We learn from Zhao Kung Wu that Wang Shi revised the ancient text of Sun Tzu, filling up lacunae and correcting mistakes. 110. 10. Ho Yan Shi of the Sung Dynasty. The personal name of this commentator is given as above by Cheng Chiao in the Tung Chi, written about the middle of the 12th century, but he appears simply as Ho Shi in the Yuhai, and Ma Tong Lin quotes Zhao Kung Wu as saying that his personal name is unknown. There seems to be no reason to doubt Cheng Chiao's statement, otherwise I should have been inclined to hazard a guess and identify him with Wan Ho Chu Fei, the author of a short treatise on war entitled, who lived in the latter part of the 11th century. 111, Ho Shi's commentary, in the words of the Tianai Co catalog, contains helpful additions here and there, but is chiefly remarkable for the copious extracts taken, in adapted form, from the dynastic histories and other sources. 11. Chang Yu. The list closes with a commentator of no great originality perhaps, but gifted with admirable powers of lucid exposition. His commentary is based on that of Cao Kung, whose terse sentences he contrives to expand and develop in masterly fashion. Without Chang Yu, it is safe to say that much of Cao Kung's commentary would have remained cloaked in its pristine obscurity and therefore valueless. His work is not mentioned in the Sung history, the Tung Kao, or the Yuhai, but it finds a niche in the Tung Chi, which also names him as the author of the lives of famous generals. 112. It is rather remarkable that the last named four should all have flourished within so short a space of time. Zhao Kung Wu accounts for it by saying, during the early years of the Sung dynasty the empire enjoyed a long spell of peace, and men ceased to practice the art of war. But when, Zhao, Yuan Hao's rebellion came, 1038-42, and the frontier generals were defeated time after time, the court made strenuous inquiry for men skilled in war, and military topics became the vogue amongst all the high officials. Hence it is that the commentators of Sun Tzu in our dynasty belong mainly to that period. 113. Besides these eleven commentators, there are several others whose work has not come down to us. The Su Shu mentions four, namely Wang Ling, often quoted by Tu Yu as, Chang Zhu Shang, Chia Shu of Wei, 114, and Shen Yu of Wu. The Tang Shu adds Sun Hao, and the Tung Chi Xiao Qi, while the Tu Shu mentions a Ming commentator, Huang Junyu. It is possible that some of these may have been merely collectors and editors of other commentaries, like Qi Tian Pao and Qi She, mentioned above. Certainly in the case of the latter, the entry in the Tung Kao. Without the following note, would give one to understand that he had written an independent commentary of his own. There are two works, described in the Shu Kou Chu Wan Shu 115, and no doubt extremely rare, which I should much like to have seen. One is entitled, In Five Chuan. It gives selections from four new commentators, probably of the Ming dynasty, as well as from the eleven known to us. The names of the four are She Yuan, Chang Ao, Li Tsai, and Huang Chi Cheng. The other work is in Four Chuan, compiled by Cheng Tone of the present dynasty. It is a compendium of information on ancient warfare, with special reference to Sun Tzu's 13 chapters. Appreciations of Sun Tzu Sun Tzu has exercised a potent fascination over the minds of some of China's greatest men. Among the famous generals who are known to have studied his pages with enthusiasm may be mentioned Han Xin, d. BC 196, 116, Feng Ai, d. AD 34, 117, Lu Meng, d. 219, 118, and Yo Fei, 1103-1141. 119, The Opinion of Cao Kung, who disputes with Han Xin the highest place in Chinese military annals, has already been recorded. 120, still more remarkable, in one way, is the testimony of purely literary men, such as Su Hasun, the father of Su Tung Po, who wrote several essays on military topics, all of which owe their chief inspiration to Sun Tzu. The following short passage by him is preserved in the Yuhai, 121. Sun Wu saying, that in war one cannot make certain of conquering, 122 is very different indeed from what other books tell us. 123, 
Wu Qi was a man of the same stamp as Sun Wu, they both wrote books on war, and they are linked together in popular speeches Sun and Wu. But Wu Qi's remarks on war are less weighty, his rules are rougher and more crudely stated, and there is not the same unity of plan as in Sun Tzu's work, where the style is terse, but the meaning fully brought out. 124. The CH. 17, contains the following extract from the impartial judgments in the Garden of Literature by Cheng Ho. Sun Tzu's 13 chapters are not only the staple and base of all military men's training, but also compel the most careful attention of scholars and men of letters. His sayings are terse yet elegant, simple yet profound, perspicuous and eminently practical. Such works as the Lun Yu, the I Ching and the Great Commentary, 125, as well as the writings of Mencius, Hsun Kuang and Yang Chu, all fall below the level of Sun Tzu. 126. Chu Shi, commenting on this, fully admits the first part of the criticism, although he dislikes the audacious comparison with the venerated classical works. Language of this sort, he says, encourages a ruler's bent towards unrelenting warfare and reckless militarism. 127. Apologies for war. Accustomed as we are to think of China as the greatest peace-loving nation on earth, we are in some danger of forgetting that her experience of war in all its phases has also been such as no modern state can parallel. Her long military annals stretch back to a point at which they are lost in the mists of time. She had built the Great Wall and was maintaining a huge standing army along her frontier centuries before the first Roman legionary was seen on the Danube. What with the perpetual collisions of the ancient feudal states, the grim conflicts with Huns, Turks and other invaders after the centralization of government, the terrific upheavals which accompanied the overthrow of so many dynasties, besides the countless rebellions and minor disturbances that have flamed up and flickered out again one by one, it is hardly too much to say that the clash of arms has never ceased to resound in one portion or another of the empire. No less remarkable is the succession of illustrious captains to whom China can. Point with pride. As in all countries, the greatest are found emerging at the most fateful crises of her history. Thus, Po Chi stands out conspicuous in the period when Qin was entering upon her final struggle with the remaining independent states. The stormy years which follow the breakup of the Qin dynasty are illumined by the transcendent genius of Han Xin. When the House of Han in turn is tottering to its fall, the great and baleful figure of Cao Cao dominates the scene. And in the establishment of the Tang dynasty, one of the mightiest tasks achieved by man, the superhuman energy of Li Ximin, afterwards the Emperor Tai Chung, was seconded by the brilliant strategy of Li Qing. None of these generals need fear comparison with the greatest names in the military history of Europe. In spite of all this, the great body of Chinese sentiment, from Lao Tzu downwards, and especially as reflected in the standard literature of Confucianism, has been consistently pacific and intensely opposed to militarism in any form. It is such an uncommon thing to find any of the literati defending warfare on principle, that I have thought it worthwhile to collect and translate a few passages in which the unorthodox view is upheld. The following, by SSU Ma Chen, shows that for all his ardent admiration of Confucius, he was yet no advocate of peace at any price. Military weapons are the means used by the sage to punish violence and cruelty, to give peace to troublous times, to remove difficulties and dangers, and to succor those who are in peril. Every animal with blood in its veins and horns on its head will fight when it is attacked. How much more so will man, who carries in his breast the faculties of love and hatred, joy and anger. When he is pleased, a feeling of affection springs up within him, when angry, his poison sting is brought into play. That is the natural law which governs his being. What then shall be said of those scholars of our time, blind to all great issues, and without any appreciation of relative values, who can only bark out their stale formulas about virtue and civilization, condemning the use of military weapons? They will surely bring our country to impotence and dishonor and the loss of her rightful heritage, or, at the very least, they will bring about invasion and rebellion, sacrifice of territory and general enfeeblement. Yet they obstinately refuse to modify the position they have taken up. The truth is that, just as in the family the teacher must not spare the rod, and punishments cannot be dispensed. Within the state, so military chastisement can never be allowed to fall into abeyance in the empire. All one can say is that this power will be exercised wisely by some, foolishly by others, and that among those who bear arms some will be loyal and others rebellious. 128. The next piece is taken from Tu Mu's preface to his commentary on Sun Tzu. War may be defined as punishment, which is one of the functions of government. It was the profession of Chang Yu and Jan Chu, both disciples of Confucius. Nowadays, the holding of trials and hearing of litigation, the imprisonment of offenders and their execution by flogging in the marketplace, are all done by officials. 
but the wielding of huge armies, the throwing down of fortified cities, the hailing of women and children into captivity, and the beheading of traitors, this is also work which is done by officials. The objects of the Rack 129, and of military weapons are essentially the same. There is no intrinsic difference between the punishment of flogging and cutting off heads in war. For the lesser infractions of law, which are easily dealt with, only a small amount of force need be employed, hence the institution of torture and flogging. For more serious outbreaks of lawlessness, which are hard to suppress, a greater amount of force is necessary, hence the use of military weapons and wholesale decapitation. In both cases, however, the end in view is to get rid of wicked people, and to give comfort and relief to the good. 130. Shisen asked Jan Yu, saying, Have you, sir, acquired your military aptitude by study, or is it innate? Jan Yu replied, It has been acquired by study. 131. How can that be so, said Chisen, seeing that you are a disciple of Confucius? It is a fact, replied Jan Yu, I was taught by Confucius. It is fitting that the great sage should exercise both civil and military functions, though to be sure my instruction in the art of fighting has not yet gone very far. Now, who the author was of this rigid distinction between the civil and the military, and the limitation of each to a separate sphere of action, or in what year of which dynasty it was first introduced, is more than I can say. But, at any rate, it has come about that the members of the governing class are quite afraid of enlarging on military topics, or do so only in a shamefaced manner. If any are bold enough to discuss the subject, they are at once set down as eccentric individuals of coarse and brutal propensities. This is an extraordinary instance of the way in which, through sheer lack of reasoning, men unhappily lose sight of fundamental principles. 132. When the Duke of Cho was minister under Cheng Wang, he regulated ceremonies and made music, and venerated the arts of scholarship and learning, yet when the barbarians of the River Wai revolted, 133, he sallied forth and chastised them. When Confucius held office under the Duke of Lu, and a meeting was convened at Chia Ku, 134, he said, if pacific negotiations are in progress, warlike preparations should have been made beforehand, he rebuked and shamed the Marquis of Qi who cowered under him and dared not proceed to violence. How can it be said that these two great sages had no knowledge of military matters? 135. We have seen that the great Chu Shi held Sun Tzu in high esteem. He also appeals to the authority of the classics. Our master Confucius, answering Duke Ling of Wei, said, I have never studied matters connected with armies and battalions. 136. Replying to Kung Wen Zhu, he said, I have not been instructed about buff coats and weapons. 137. But if we turn to the meeting at Chia Ku, 138, we find that he used armed force against the men of Lai, 139, so that the Marquis of Qi was overawed. Again, when the inhabitants of Pai revolted, he ordered his officers to attack them, whereupon they were defeated and fled in confusion. 140. He once uttered the words, If I fight, I conquer. 141, and Janu also said, The sage exercises both civil and military functions. 142, can it be a fact that Confucius never studied or received instruction in the art of war? We can only say that he did not specially choose matters connected with armies and fighting to be the subject of his teaching. 143. Sun Xing Yen, the editor of Sun Tzu, writes in similar strain. Confucius said, I am unversed in military matters. He also said, If I fight, I conquer. 144. Confucius ordered ceremonies and regulated music. Now war constitutes one of the five classes of state ceremonial, 145, and must not be treated as an independent branch of study. Hence, the words I am unversed in must be taken to mean that there are things which even an inspired teacher does not know. Those who have to lead an army and devise stratagems, must learn the art of war but if one can command the services of a good general like Sun Tzu, who was employed by Wu Zushu, there is no need to learn it oneself. Hence the remark added by Confucius, if I fight, I conquer. 146. The men of the present day, however, willfully interpret these words of Confucius in their narrowest sense, as though he meant that books on the art of war were not worth reading. With blind persistency, they adduce the example of Zhao Kua, who poured over his father's books to no purpose, 147 as a proof that all military theory is useless. Again, seeing that books on war have to do with such things as opportunism in designing plans, and the conversion of spies, they hold that the art is immoral and unworthy of a sage. These people ignore the fact that the studies of our scholars and the civil administration of our officials also require steady application and practice before efficiency is reached. The ancients were particularly chary of allowing 
mere novices to botch their work. 148, weapons are baneful 149, and fighting perilous, and unless a general is in constant practice, he ought not to hazard other men's lives in battle. 150, hence it is essential that Sun Tzu's 13 chapters should be studied. 151. Shang Liang used to instruct his nephew Qi 152 in the art of war. Qi got a rough idea of the art in its general bearings, but would not pursue his studies to their proper outcome, the consequence being that he was finally defeated and overthrown. He did not realize that the tricks and artifices of war are beyond verbal computation. Duke Shang of Sun 153 and King Yin of Shu 154, were brought to destruction by their misplaced humanity. The treacherous and underhand nature of war necessitates the use of guile and stratagem suited to the occasion. There is a case on record of Confucius himself having violated an extorted oath, 155, and also of his having left the Sung state in disguise. 156, can we then recklessly arraign Sun Tzu for disregarding truth and honesty? 157. Bibliography. The following are the oldest Chinese treatises on war, after Sun Tzu. The notes on each have been drawn principally from the SSU Kou Chuan Shu Chen Ming Mu Lu, ch. 9, Fall. 22 SQQ. 1. Wu Zhu, in one Chuan or six chapters. By Wu Qi, D, BC 381. A genuine work. Si Shi Qi, ch. 65. 2. SSU Ma Fa, in one Chuan or five chapters. Wrongly attributed to SSU Ma Jiang Chu of the 6th century BC its date, however, must be early, as the customs of the three ancient dynasties are constantly to be met with in its pages. 158, Si Shi Chi, ch. 64. The SSU Kau Chu An Shu, ch. 99, f. 1, remarks that the oldest three treatises on war, Sun Tzu, Wu Tzu and the SSU Ma Fa, are, generally speaking, only concerned with things strictly military, the art of producing, collecting, training and drilling troops, and the correct theory with regard to measures of expediency, laying plans, transport of goods and the handling of soldiers 159 in strong contrast to later works, in which the science of war is usually blended with metaphysics, divination and magical arts in general. 3. Lu Tao, in 6 Chuan or 60 chapters. Attributed to Lu Wang, or Lu Shang, also known as Tai Kung, of the 12th century BC 160, but its style does not belong to the era of the three dynasties. 161, Lu Deming, 550-625 AD, mentions the work, and enumerates the headings of the six sections, and so that the forgery cannot have been later than the Suai dynasty. 4. Wei Liao Zhu, in 5 Chuan. Attributed to Wei Liao, 4th cent. BC, who studied under the famous Kui Kuzu. The under mentions a book of Wei Liao in 31 chapters, whereas the text we possess contains only 24. Its matter is sound enough in the main, though the strategical devices differ considerably from those of the Warring States period. 162, it has been furnished with a commentary by the well-known Sung philosopher Chang Tsai. 5. San Lui, and 3 Chuan. Attributed to Huang Shikang, a legendary personage who is said to have bestowed it on Chang Liang, Yi. BC 187, in an interview on a bridge. 163, but here again, the style is not that of works dating from the Qin or Han period. The Han Emperor Kuang Wu, AD 25-57, apparently quotes from it in one of his proclamations, but the passage in question may have been inserted later on, in order to prove the genuineness of the work. We shall not be far out if we refer it to the Northern Sun period, 420-478 AD, or somewhat earlier. 164. 6. Li Wei Kung Wen Tui, in three sections. Written in the form of a dialogue between Tai Chung and his great general Li Qing, it is usually ascribed to the latter. Competent authorities consider it a forgery, though the author was evidently well versed in the art of war. 165. 7. Li Qing Ping Fa, not to be confounded with the foregoing, is a short treatise in eight chapters, preserved in the Tung Tian, but not published separately. This fact explains its omission from the SSU Kou Chu An Shu. 8. Wu Qi Ching, 166 in Wan Chuan. Attributed to the legendary minister Feng Ho, with exegetical notes by Kung Sun Hung of the Han. Dynasty, D, BC 121, and said to have been eulogized by the celebrated general Ma Lun, E, AD 300. Yet the earliest mention of it is in the. Although a forgery, the work is well put together. 167. 
Considering the high popular estimation in which Chukul Liang has always been held, it is not surprising to find more than one work on war ascribed to his pen. Such are, 1, the Shi Lu Si, 1 Chuan, preserved in the Yang Lo Ta Tian, 2, Chang Yuan, 1 ch, and, 3, Xin Shu, 1 ch, which steals wholesale from Sun Tzu. None of these has the slightest claim to be considered genuine. Most of the large Chinese encyclopedias contain extensive sections devoted to the literature of war. The following references may be found useful. Tung Tian, circa 800 AD, ch. 148 to 162. Taiping Yulan, 983, ch. 270 to 359. Wen Sheng Tung Kao, 13th cent, ch. 221. Yu Hai, 13th cent, ch. 140, 141. San Sai Tu Away, 16th cent, ch. 7, 8. Quang Po Wu Chi, 1607, ch. 31, 32. Chen Kiel Le Shu, 1632, ch. 75. Yuan Chen Lei Han, 1710, ch. 206 to 229. Ku Chin Tu Shu Chi Cheng, 1726. Section 30, especially ch. 8190. Shu Wen Sheng Tung Kao, 1784, ch. 121 to 134. Huang Zhao Cheng Shi Wen Pian, 1826, ch. 76, 77. The bibliographical sections of certain historical works also deserve mention. Chen Han Shu, ch. 30. Sui Shu, ch. 32 to 35. Chu Tang Shu, ch. 46, 47. Xin Tang Shu, ch. 57 to 60. Sung Shi, ch. 202 to 209. Tung Chi, circa 1150, ch. 68. To these, of course, must be added the great catalog of the Imperial Library. SSU Kou Chu Wan Shu Chang Mu Ti Yao, 1790, ch. 99, 100. I. Lane plans. This is the only possible meaning of, which M. Amiot and Captain Caltra wrongly translate Phone Mondalar Militaire and First Principles respectively. Cao Kung says it refers to the deliberations in the temple selected by the general for his temporary use, or as we should say, in his tent. See section 26. 1. Sun Tzu said, the art of war is of vital importance to the state. 2. It is a matter of life and death, a road either to safety or to ruin. Hence it is a subject of inquiry which can on no account be neglected. 3. The art of war, then, is governed by five constant factors, to be taken into account in one's deliberations, when seeking to determine the conditions obtaining in the field. The old text of the Tong Tian has, etc. later editors have inserted after, and before. The former correction is perhaps superfluous, but the latter seems necessary in order to make sense, and is supported by the accepted reading in section 12, where the same words recur. I am inclined to think, however, that the whole sentence from two is an interpolation and has no business here at all. If it be retained, Wang Shi must be right in saying that denotes the seven considerations in section 13. Are the circumstances or conditions likely to bring about victory or defeat? The antecedent of the first is, of the second. Contains the idea of comparison with the enemy, which cannot well be brought out here, but will appear in section 12. Altogether, Difficult though it is, the passage is not so hopelessly corrupt as to justify Captain Caltrop in burking it entirely. 4. These are, 1. The moral law. 2. Heaven. 3. Earth. 4. The commander. 5. Method and discipline. It appears from what follows that Sun Tzu means by a principle of harmony, not unlike the Tao of Lao Tzu in its moral aspect. One might be tempted to render it by. Morale were it not considered as an attribute of the ruler in section 13. 5. 6. The moral law causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler, so that they will follow him regardless of their lives, undismayed by any danger. The original text omits, inserts an after each, and omits after. Captain Caltrop translates, if the ruling authority be upright, the people are united a very pretty sentiment, but wholly out of place in what purports to be a translation of Sun Tzu. 7. Heaven signifies night and day, cold and heat, times and seasons. The commentators, I think, make an unnecessary mystery of. Thus Meng Shi defines the words as the hard and the soft, waxing and waning, 
which does not help us much. Wang Shi, however, may be right in saying that what is meant is the general economy of heaven, including the five elements, the four seasons, wind and clouds, and other phenomena. 8. Earth comprises distances, great and small, danger and security, open ground and narrow passes, the chances of life and death. Omitted by Captain Caltrop, may have been included here because the safety of an army depends largely on its quickness to turn these geographical features to account. 9. The commander stands for the virtues of wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage and strictness. The five cardinal virtues of the Chinese are, 1. Humanity or benevolence. 2. Uprightness of mind. 3. Self-respect, self-control, or proper feeling. 4. Wisdom. 5. Sincerity or good faith. Here and are put before and the two military virtues of courage and strictness substituted for and. 10. By method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivisions, the gradations of rank among the officers, the maintenance of roads by which supplies may reach the army, and the control of military expenditure. The Chinese of this sentence is so concise as to be practically unintelligible without commentary. I have followed the interpretation of Cao Kung, who joins in again. Others take each of the six predicates separately. Has the somewhat uncommon sense of cohort or division of an army. Captain Caltrop translates, partition and ordering of troops, which only covers. 11. These five heads should be familiar to every general, he who knows them will be victorious, he who knows them not will fail. 12. Therefore, in your deliberations, when seeking to determine the military conditions, let them be made the basis of a comparison, in this wise, the Yulan has an interpolated before. It is obvious, however, that the just enumerated cannot be described as. Captain Caltrop, forced to give some rendering of the words which he had omitted in section 3, shows himself decidedly hazy, further, with regard to these and the following seven matters, the condition of the enemy must be compared with our own. He does not appear to see that the seven queries or considerations which follow arise directly out of the five heads, instead of being supplementary to them. 13. 1. Which of the two sovereigns is imbued with the moral law? i.e., is in harmony with his subjects. cf. Section 5. 2. Which of the two generals has most ability? 3. With whom lie the advantages derived from heaven and earth? See Section 7. 8. 4. On which side is discipline most rigorously enforced? 